Welcome to the Evolved Caveman, where men learn to be successful and happy with your host, Dr. John Schinnerer, as he shares the most impactful ideas and practices for you to get the most from your relationships, your work, and from your life. Now, here's Dr. John. Hey, all you Evolved Cavemen and cave women out there. This is Dr. John with the Evolved Caveman podcast. And if you like some of the stuff that you've heard out there, be sure to check out my individual coaching packages at guidetoself.com. You can find out more at the evolvedcaveman.com. And be sure to check out the Ultimate Couples Retreat, which is a week-long, idyllic, adventure and journey into learning more about yourself and your partner and ways to reconnect in Costa Rica, September, 2020. You can find out more at the ultimate relationship.com. Hey everybody, this is Dr. John back with another episode of the evolved caveman. And today I am really psyched to have with me Elise Schuster and Elise is a sexuality educator with 15 years in pleasure-based sex education and youth development. Elise is the founder of OK So, a free online platform that connects young adults with questions about sex and mental health to experts they can't reach any other way. Elise has a master's in public health from Columbia University with a specialization in sexuality and health and spent many years working at Babeland and at The Door, a major youth development agency in New York City. Elise, welcome. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Ah, it's my pleasure. Thanks for coming aboard. So tell me the story of you at your very best. What does that look like in terms of, you know, kind of overcoming some struggle and then that's generally you at your very best? I think my biggest struggle is you know, I was raised, a, a, I grew up in the Midwest uh, and raised in a family that really values sort of giving back to other people and like living a life sort of for other people. And I think that that's great. And also it has meant that a lot in my life I've struggled with like kind of doing things for myself and finding the things that are the right, right thing for me, taking care of my own needs. So I think me at my best is when I'm like able to really figure out what it is that I need and take care of that without judging myself for it. With, uh, without judging myself is a, one of the key phrases there. I huge. Imagine. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So much. I think, the, I think especially sort of Midwest culture like really specializes in uh, like having a lot of judgment that goes unsaid. Mm -hmm. And so you're sort of always judging other people and assuming that you're being judged and there's just a lot of that happening. And so it's very easy to take that and put it onto yourself. So I'm really, my project of kind of these few years of my life is really about like, how do I try to let go of my inner judge, even the negative and the positive, right. And just yeah. kind of put it, recognize that it's just a judge and try to just live my life. Well, and I just see that as a voice from within. And I see it usually coming from, like, I see us as all having like a younger self, like a five-year-old self within us, maybe a 15-year-old self, and then the the functional adult. And um, so I see that often as coming from the youngest self. Like, mm -hmm. you should do this. You should do that. Why aren't you doing more of this? And And then throwing a tantrum if... We don't do what he or she says. Um, but yeah, I, and I love that idea in, in mindfulness to allow whatever's arising to arise without judgment. Mm -hmm. And that without judgment piece could take you the rest of your life. Yes, yes, exactly. I think this it's really not, a... This is not a one-year project. No, no, it's a practice, right? It's, a, it's something that I think is a, a sort of winding road and some days are better and some days are not and some things are easier and some things are harder and yeah. yeah and, and I think it's a, it's a very, very worthwhile practice too to engage in. I think it's one of the most worthwhile. Yeah, I actually, I saw an article yesterday that... Uh, that practicing, like working on and practicing non-judgment is actually one of the biggest suicide preventers. Um, oh, interesting. Yeah. Which I, I thought was that. a really, yeah, I immediately, I was sort of like, oh, of course, right. Like that would make sense. Because um, in suicidality, one of the biggest um, hallmarks or, or red flags is I'm a burden to my loved ones. And that exactly. right there is a judgment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you can like let go of all of the judgments about like, how you're supposed to be in the world and the way, you know, all the ways that you are not showing up or, you know, that you're broken or all of the things that people I think believe about themselves. Like if you could let that go, then yeah, I thought it was it. 
I didn't even read the full article. <laughs> I saw the headline yeah. and I was like, mm-hmm, I will 100% believe that that is true. When one of the things that ties into this really closely is, you know, one of the ways I believe the mind works is by comparison to others. Mm -hmm. And, and so those comparisons I find are deadly, you know, he's got bigger biceps, he's got a nicer car, he's got a bigger house, he makes more money, he's got a cuter girlfriend, he's got a bigger dick, whatever it is, our mind works a lot by comparison. And those comparisons usually make us feel less than. Yes, absolutely. The thing we, this happens all the time on, on the questions that we get on okay, so because I think especially being a teenager is about like entering into the world of comparisons in a lot of ways. I think often when you're a kid, you sort of don't really consider it. And then it kind of hits you like a ton of bricks in your teen years and how you deal with that in many ways sort of shapes who you become as an adult. You kind of get stuck in that cycle or do you figure out ways around it? And one of the things that we often say to folks is that when we look at someone else, we're seeing their sort of highlight reel, you know, in the film of their lives. And when we look at ourselves, we see all of our behind the scenes, all the takes we messed up, all the things we had to cut. Right. And so it's never a fair comparison because we're never, we never see someone else's behind the scenes. It's interesting. I was just thinking back when I was a kid, like middle school, elementary school, like I was really competitive and so I would compete with everybody in every area, academic, sports, you know, whatever it was. And so to me, that competition is kind of, quote unquote, the game. And mm. it's funny we were talking about the most intelligent people we've met before we got on air. And it, it seems like you can either buy into that game of competing with others, mm-hmm. or you can completely check out of the game. And a couple of the smartest people that I know in my life completely checked out of the game at relatively young ages and just kind of did their own thing and just was like... I think they recognized the game at some point and just thought this isn't really worth playing. Right. Well, I think it ties back to that, to the judge, right. Which is that like the, the judge doesn't come out of nowhere. It comes from all of the people in our lives around us. And so if we're, if we're playing that, if we're in that game, essentially what we're saying is that like, we're, we're giving that judge all of that power, Mm -hmm. right? That we have to compare ourselves to other people and we have to like be better than or worse than. Whereas if we can let that judge go and just know that who we are and what we like to do and how we like to be in the world is great, then we don't have to be in that anymore. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that was a complete tangent, but I really enjoyed it. Yeah, um, me too. So let's get to the topic at hand. So how did you get into a career of educating people around sex? Well, like many people, I think, who go into these kinds of professions, uh, I got into it because it was something I was experiencing myself. So in my Midwestern upbringing, I grew up in a really conservative, uh, very traditional, very religious household. And I actually was not allowed to take sexuality education classes in high school because they were taught by someone that everyone suspected was a lesbian. Um, And so I had to go and find all the information for myself. And I'm old enough that that was before Google. You know, I had like an, I had an Apple IIe when I was 13. (laughs) So I was like trying to kind of figure out everything that I might want to know and became the person who my friends would go to. And Mm -hmm. that just kind of morphed into, uh, I did a peer health education program in college and realized that actually I really liked talking with people about these issues and uh, that it was a, a really energizing kind of experience for me. So then I was sort of off and running from there. So you sort of talk about things that make other people uncomfortable for a career. I love that. Yeah, that is my whole job. I, uh, and I, it, it's a really fun place to get to be because what it means is that you often get to see parts of people that they wouldn't show anyone else. Because if you can handle something that makes them feel uncomfortable in a way that helps them feel better, then they will sort of open up a lot of other things to you often. So I frequently have experiences of people telling me things that they've never told anyone else. And sometimes I think that they maybe even haven't fully told themselves Mm -hmm. yet. It's interesting. I remember talking with a couples therapist several years ago, and she said she, she did sex therapy. And she said, sex therapy is like doing couples therapy on steroids because it <laughs> just sort of gets to the heart of these matters more quickly. Yes. Sex. Partly for, what you're, for the reasons you're talking about. Yes. I mean, I think often we, we because of the place that's the sort of shameful and weird place that sex holds in our current society, we often take it and kind of put it to the side. 
and act like it's in its own little box over there that is different from our other really our friendships our other relationships our work life etc it's this like secret thing we never talk about but in reality sex is the microcosm of the rest of our lives so how we show up in our relationships generally it's going to be magnified when we're like thinking about intimate things how we think about like to go back to even my own example of like if I'm taking care of myself, I feel selfish right there. I've met so many people who feel like they don't really deserve pleasure or they don't deserve to articulate their own needs. And that's not just happening. I mean, it's particularly strong when we're thinking about sex, but it's happening everywhere in their lives, right? That that that's what they believe. So the things that we believe about ourselves and the things that we believe about our relationships in the world, like they're just like super concentrated when we think about our sex lives. Yes. You can take what's happening within the sexual realm and extrapolate it to their whole lives. Yes. And so then I think what's tricky about this is that I think people often start with sex, right? They're like, well, I need to fix this thing. And it's like, you can't, that's not going to get better until you see all, like if you believe that you don't deserve to have your needs met when it comes to sex, like, and you that you can't fix that without working on how you don't believe that you deserve to have your needs met anywhere in your life. So it becomes this, like, again, we, we have to sort of really bring them back and integrate our sexual lives into the rest of our lives and be able to have these conversations. Otherwise we can't uncover all of this and we can't actually like work on any of it. Yeah. I think those are really good points. So again, drilling down further to what I think many of the listeners want to know is how do we make men better at sex? What do men need to know? And that, that's a, that's a very open ended question. <laughs> I yeah. need to know everything. Do you have eight hours? No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Um, I mean, you know, I think that a couple of the biggest things that I've seen over and over again, having conversations with people are, uh, is the first thing is that we sort of have this idea that like, this is how things quote unquote, like should be right. There's this kind of expectation of what should happen during sex or how someone's body should respond or how we should feel, uh, or what we should do. And generally all of the, none of that is true, right? So the more that, uh, the more that everyone can kind of open ourselves up to the idea that everyone's body is different, that everyone's body responds in different ways to different things and needs different things at different times. And so that it really becomes about not thinking of it as like, this is how I do this all the time, but like, what are we doing today? <laughs> like, what do, what do you need today? What do I need today? What feels good today? And really making it about getting to know the other person and getting to know yourself and where you're at. Um, that I, I think the, the sort of structures that we have around like what sex should be are one, are one of the things that cause like the most uh, sort of anxiety and pain and shame because the minute that that doesn't happen, then someone is broken or something is wrong. Right. And, and it kind of becomes this whole thing. Um, and then I think the other thing is that I see a lot of guys who, who feel, again, I think there's this kind of traditional idea around like what your role is or what, uh, what like a successful, encounter looks like, um, right. There's like penis and vagina sex and an orgasm, something like that. Right. So like, the more that we can like let go of that stuff and have it be about not like a destination of like we, or like a checklist of things that happened, but more about the experience of being with someone else and what it means to have like an intimate an intimate experience where you're being vulnerable with someone else and you're kind of sharing these moments, then, then there's so much more room for creativity, for joy, for silly things to happen, right? Like people don't want, you know, don't want to like laugh during sex. I was going to say sex with laughter is amazing. It's amazing. And like stuff funny, there are funny noises, things slip into the wrong places. Like things don't go the way that we, but like we have this idea that it has to be like perfect every time where we've failed. And so really just really, really trying to encourage people to uh, try to break out of that as much as possible and to just be with the person that you're with 
and figure out like really who, what, where are you at today? Where are they at today? What are the things that you want to do with no expectations about like who will have an orgasm or how that will happen or what, you know, what does it mean if you use a sex toy or not use a sex toy? What does it mean if how many partners have they had? How many partners have you had? Like there's all of this, like everything gets again, because sex is a microcosm, it gets like tied up into our self-worth in a way that is really, can be really damaging. So really just trying to like let go of those judges again. When I think, you know, and again, forgive me, this is a little bit stereotypical, but I'm often speaking to men and a lot of the men that I speak to are highly competitive. Mm-hmm. And that's how we've been socialized, right? Is to compete and try to win. And then we get into the realm of sex and we have that same competitive mindset. So we think that one orgasm is good, two orgasms better, three orgasm is winning, you know, even in, in ourselves or in our partners, right? It's mm-hmm. just more is better. And I, I think we often lose sight of things like valuing simple touch Mm -hmm. that you know it's as you said it's not always about the orgasm i think it maybe if we value just touch and connection more than the the output or the end result of orgasm we might all be a little bit better off yeah absolutely i mean i think if you think about it as like food is often a very good analogy for sex so if you think about like going to a fancy restaurant and focusing only on eating all the food on your plate, right? Like you're missing every bite that you're taking and every, you know, every, like all the sensory experiences of going to a nice restaurant and enjoying a wonderful meal because you're, because there's this idea of like, like essentially we sort of have this idea that like, it hasn't been worth it if you didn't do X, right? Yeah, like eat it all. Yeah. Um, or like you're going on a hike and, you know, you have to get to the top. If you don't get to the top of the mountain, then you haven't really hiked. Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Which is like, you've missed like all of the, maybe there was like a bear or like a rattlesnake. Right. And you were like, don't, don't not paying attention to that. Like gotta get to the top of the mountain. With the eating analogy, I mean, like it it makes me think of mindful eating where you slow down, Mm -hmm. savor each bite. You get to really know the flavors and the textures and consider where have the, where is this food come from? Who's helped to bring it to me here? And I, I think, you know, you can do the same thing in sex where if you mindfully have sex or make love and slow it down and enjoy each second and each part, aside from just intercourse and orgasm, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I think that that's a, to me, a much better, better way to make love. Yes, um, absolutely. But again, but I, there's that judgment, yeah. right? Yes, completely. And I think one of the things that I often suggest to folks, and I think a lot of sex therapists do as well, is to actually like the thing that you feel like you you do the most or that you sort of rely on the most, like for a month, take that off the table. Don't mm-hmm. do it. Right. Because you, you can sort of force yourself to be more creative, to open yourself up to other ideas. And then you can find all sorts of new and fun things to do when you don't have like the same thing that you're doing hey, sort of every time. Favor, tell the story of when you were teaching classes at, was it the, what's the, the story you're working at? I was working at Babeland. Babeland. Yeah. I think good vibrations, but um, tell that story when you were teaching classes for men versus women, that was kind of eye opening for me. Yeah. So Babeland does a lot, like a lot of the sex toy stores like Babeland do classes. And um, what we found while I was working there was that we could, we could have probably had a class on how to give a blow job once a month and in New York city and it would have sold out pretty much every time. And we would do classes on cunnilingus and there were classes we had to cancel because they, and like we did them maybe every six months and we had to cancel some of them because there weren't enough tickets sold. So not enough men were coming in to find out how to be better. Lots of women were coming in to find out how to be better at sex. So, I mean, to me that speaks volumes about our willingness to learn our growth mindset, our interest in becoming better. And I don't know if that's because we just think we know it all and we're the kings in the bedroom or because we don't need to get better Mm -hmm. or or because we're scared. I I mean, I think the other part of it is, and you know, you could argue, I don't have the time for it, but I think the other part is it's kind of like men asking for directions when lost. We don't (laughs) like to ask for help. We don't like to admit we don't know. And so that might be part of that as well. Absolutely. I think men are really socialized to know what they're doing, 
when it comes to sex. And so I don't think that there's, I think there is a lot of fear. I think there's not a lot of room for admitting that you're learning or that you're not sure, like you are supposed to be sort of, uh, you know, yeah, the King, right. You're supposed to kind of like have it all figured out. And, uh, conversely, I think women are often socialized to believe that like you could lose your man at any second. And if he's not happy in the bedroom, then like, that's it. So there's this kind of constant, you know, the, the blowjob classes that we would do were like, everyone wanted the like one thing, <laughs> like this was sort of the theme of working at Babeland is like everyone, everyone comes in and they want like the one thing that's going to fix it. Right. Like what's the best, what's the best sex toy. And I'm like, that doesn't exist. There isn't like one vibrator that if there was <laughs> one, if there was one vibrator, then that's all we would sell. We would, mm-hmm. wouldn't need to be here. So that doesn't exist. Like what's the one blowjob tip? I'm like, nope, that, you know, so and people would get very frustrated because it was like, just tell me the thing, right? Like, just tell me the thing that I need to do you to need make the it one better. button to push. Yeah. Because we all, and so to some degree, I think humans, you know, of course, like a simpler thing we would prefer over something that's complex. And so, you know, the amount of times that I've had to say like, everyone is different and you need to get to know your partner and figure out what they like and talk about it. And you can just feel people internally being like, uh, you know, like, well, I mean, there's a, there's a couple of things that enter into this that, that kind of fascinate me. I was watching a documentary, I think it was on the, um, I forget, if, I think it was the female orgasm on Netflix. And there was a stat on there about the percentage of women that orgasm routinely mm-hmm. in a heterosexual relationship versus the, per, the percentage of time or the, you know, the average number of the average time um, that lesbians would orgasm with a female partner. And it was something in the 50% for heterosexual, yeah. I think in the 70 high 70 percent for yes. lesbians. And so it says to me that a females know their body better, but also that I think there's more time taken. And I would assume, and this is a big assumption that there's more communication going on about what you like how can I please you? How can you please me? Yeah. Because I think a lot of this has to do with communication. And I don't think most of us are very comfortable communicating about in these areas. And I think that's one of the goals to me is to get better at communicating and hearing, oh, you want me to do this lighter without mm-hmm. getting, without defensive. stonewalling, without getting yeah. angry, without getting defensive, without shutting down and just being like, oh, okay, you know, thank you for letting me know. Let me try that out. Yes, exactly. Well, and again, because I think that, you know, we, because we put sex like over in the corner and we don't talk about it and we think that we just have to be good at it and that everybody's like, that there's this formula that we have to get right. Like none, none of the things about how our world thinks about sex and its place in our lives are set up to make communicating about sex easy. Mm -hmm. And also none of us, I think almost no one learns how to have hard conversations in our lives. Like, most of our family, you know, we, our families avoid them or yell at each other or like we're sort of, so we're really, uh, it's not like there's anything wrong with any of us that we can't do this. It's just most of us haven't had an opportunity to really learn how. And one of the th- things that I always, uh, that I always suggest is the, the first, like, I think most important thing that you can do is take it out of the bedroom because often what people do is they try to have the conversations before, like right before, during, or right after. And that's when we're at our most raw. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to have a conversation where you're trying to give someone any kind of like constructive feedback in those moments. And so one of the best things that we can do is set up a regular time And that again, like who schedules the idea, like we have this idea that sex is spontaneous. Like we don't, it just happens, right. But it doesn't just happen (laughs) ever. So we need to think about our communication about sex the same way. So scheduling a regular time every month, every other month, that is a conversation about our sex lives with that person and where we are not, we are eating dinner or taking a walk or taking a drive or doing something completely different because then we, there, we have so much more capacity and space to hear things that we might need to do a little bit differently than if it's like the, the thing that we just, just like two minutes ago, didn't do very well. Yeah. And, and one of the things that it makes me think of in terms of conversation is, that, you know, one of the things we teach in couples classes is this idea of gratitude, 
appreciation for what the other person's doing right, like mm-hmm. catch them doing well, just like you would do with a child, but you want to reward the behaviors you want to see with yes. you know, compliment or calling it out. Um, and it, it, like one of the things you could do is if you're going for a walk with your loved one and you could say something like, Hey, sweetheart, you know, yesterday when we were making love, I really enjoyed it when you, you know, ran your lips up and down the side of my shaft. Like that really felt good. Right. So you, you encourage getting more of what you like. And yes. I think that, you know, it's hard for people to say those kind of things because I don't know, maybe it's embarrassing. Yeah. I know it was to me 20 years ago. Yeah, no, it does feel embarrassing. I think, uh, it feels, I think we, ha- you know, we have this like, uh, sort of dichotomy in our, in our society where if you know too much, right, there's like some invisible <laughs> line, there's like an invisible line that you cross where like, if you know too much or you can talk about things that way, you're like weird or kinky or a freak or promiscuous or whatever, a slut or like whatever word. It makes me think use. of Saturday Night Live with, you know, Jane, you ignorant slut. Yes. That goes yeah. way back. I don't know if you go back. That yes. Far. No, I do. I do. And, you know, and if you're like, and then, and then there's another invisible line where if you can't do it at all, you're and or you're like cold or, mm-hmm. and, and everybody draws that line in a different place, which I think is, that's the other like amazing thing about, working at a place like Babeland or sort of doing this work is if you, when you talk to enough people, you really get to see where everybody draws their line. Like people would walk in and be like, so I want to experiment with kink. And then the next sentence about what they wanted to try would be like night and day different from the next person who walked in with that. Right. Or people, people would walk in and be like, my favorite was like back to back. I would get people who would be like, so I just got into a relationship. So I'm here to buy a vibrator. And then the next person would walk in and be like, so I just got out of a relationship. (laughs) So I'm here to buy a vibrator. Right. And I wanted to be like, you two should talk because (laughs) your ideas of when you use sex toys are complete. And you're like both convinced that like, obviously this is the way the world works, but you have completely different ideas of this. I was thinking of someone coming in saying, I want to check out kink and saying, can I try a feather? I don't know if it's a Yes, feather. yes. And then someone else coming in saying, I want to try out kink. Can I get a whole dungeon installed in my basement? You know, yes. I mean, it essentially is that range. Like, yeah. you know, I've had people be like, my, my wife like just told me she wants to spank me and I'm like freaking out about it. And then the next person is like freaking out about something, you know, they're freaking out about like the size of the dildo that someone wants yeah. to put in their or butt or something, or something, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it really is like, we're all in our own place and there is no, um, there's nothing to like, there's no judgment about, again, like back to the judge, right? There's like, there's no reason for us to be judging ourselves about where we are or comparing ourselves to other people. It's just where we are. Um, but the person that we're with is a completely different person with a totally different set of needs. And so the fun part, this is the thing is that I think sometimes we frame like getting to know what someone else likes, like our, our partners likes as like work, in, instead of what it actually is, which is like a really fun adventure that we get to go uh-huh. on with someone else. Yeah, so I, I think, think if we get and see it that way. If you, go to, if you go at it with curiosity, compassion, non-judgment, mm-hmm. like you can go all sorts of exciting, fun, yeah. pleasurable places. Yeah. And if you can explore, if you can sort of approach it from that mindset, then when someone says like, when you did this, it felt so good, right? Then you're like, sweet. That's like, that's an like awesome data point for things I should keep doing. And it's much easier to hear when someone says, and then this other thing kind of didn't really work for me. And again, it just becomes like, Oh, that food, right? Like I went to this restaurant, they brought me like a whole bunch of things. I didn't really like that thing, but I really loved this thing. Like Mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with any of us. Like we all have, I, I hate, mint chocolate chip ice cream. There's nothing wrong with me for hating mint chocolate chip ice cream. It's just, I don't like it. Right. So the more we can kind of see it that same way and be like excited about the things that are working and work on how we change the things that aren't like without it meaning that we're like a bad person that we did, that we didn't know that yeah, already. I, I am so sorry. My mind went to, and I don't like kielbasa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. Bad joke. Food, um, food is always like, <laughs> Food is like one of the best metaphors for sex, actually, I think. Like it works in so many different ways. So there was, there yes. was that animated movie that uh, Seth Rogen did. I forget. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That was pretty funny. I forget the name of it, but that was hilarious. Um, so the other thing that, that, well, as long as we're on the topic of vibrators, let's, let's address some of men's deepest fears 
about Huge. the vibrator. Mm-hmm. And how many times have you been asked if vibrators are going to replace me as a man? I've lost count of the amount of times that I've been asked that question. Uh, it's one of the most common questions. And actually women also have a similar fear that if they try a vibrator, that like nothing else will feel good. Uh Um, And so that's just an interesting thing to know that uh, there's a lot of anxiety about vibrators just generally in the world. And so I think, you know, what's important to remember is like, there's sort of the first piece is that uh, it's helpful to know a little bit about anatomy and how our bodies work. And so the first piece of this is that all of our erogenous zones are that way because they have more nerve endings. And so, you know, the clitoris has the clitoris and the penis actually have about the same amount of nerve endings. It's just that in the that, clitoris, about 80,000, 8,000, 8,000. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, I, 80,000 would be, Whew, uh, an interesting world to live in. Um, you can think about that later. Yeah, I will. I will. Uh, and so we, so, but in the, what's the difference is right. That in the clitoris they're, they're condensed into a much smaller space. And so if you think about like basic physics, the principles of basic physics, like I, I used to ask people at Babeland, like, okay, if I have to step on your foot, I can either step on your foot wearing like a regular shoe or a stiletto heel, which would you prefer? Like, obviously you would prefer the regular shoe because the pressure is distributed more Mm -hmm. evenly. The stiletto heel is going to hurt a lot more. So sensitivity works the same way. Like the penis, the nerves are spread out a little bit more. The clitoris, they're much more condensed. So the, the clitoris is much more sensitive in that way. But nerve endings generally respond to repetitive motion of all kinds, right? So that's why thrusting feels good. That's why, you know, repetitive licking feels good or fingering. And it's why vibrators feel good. And vibrators, I think, you know, a a sex toy does one thing (laughs) and it does that one thing very well, which is it does repetitive motion. Um, but it is never a person. (laughs) So, you know, I've, uh, like I always used to joke that like, I've never met a person who can vibrate (laughs) <laughs> right? like, I would, like I would love to meet, uh, if there, if anyone knows someone who can vibrate, like I would really love to meet that person, but no one can vibrate and vibrators can't do any of the things that people can do. Right. Uh, they just, they have one job. That's the job that they do. And so I think a lot of guys who are really scared that vibrators are going to replace them. Really what it is, is a fear that like there's n- somehow like they don't understand all of the ways that they are interacting with their partner and all of the ways that all of the ways that like two people together create something magical that you can't, you, but a toy cannot do, right. A toy can like make your body feel good in a specific way. A human being can Mm -hmm. do an infinite number of other things. The other thing is that just like food, we all like different things. And so there are plenty of people out there for whom vibrators that's not what their body likes. Their body really likes tongues or their body likes fingers or their body likes water from shower heads or pillows that they mm. kind of hump against or whatever it might be. Um, and just like, you know, I think there are like many like penises out there that like at least somewhat different environments to be in. Uh, and so there are some people for whom vibration is like the top thing for them. That's what their body really likes. And then there are other people whose bodies don't want that. So it's really, again, it's really about just figuring, there's no judgment about where you're at. It's just, that's what your body is. And that's what it likes. And and to me, it's augmentation. It's additive. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you can do like penetration along with a vibrator and that helps your woman to achieve orgasm, God bless her. God bless you. Like so, (laughs) so much the better. Absolutely. Well, 70% of women need direct clitoral stimulation in order to have an orgasm. And there actually are not a ton of nerve endings in the vagina, which makes sense because a lot of other things happen in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it would be like even more painful to have a baby or other, you know, so the clitoris is really the focus of the nerve endings. In fact, the, the penis and the clitoris come from the same embryonic tissue. So they actually have the same basic structure. The clitoris and the penis have a head, 
a shaft and roots that can go back into the body. It's just the clitoris is a smaller version or rather actually because in anatomy, the, if no hormones kind of kick in during fetal development, everything it would, the body would develop as a clitoris. So technically Mm. like the female anatomy is the default. And then, so the, the penis is really like a bigger version of the clitoris. <laughs> so, uh, cause I think we often talk as if like the male side of things is the default as opposed gotcha. to when actually in reality it's not. Um, but I think, so I think even just knowing that I think can really help people because I think there's often this idea that like, if you think about a vibrator and I think a lot of ways that people think about using vibrators is internally as like replacing mm. sort of penetration and thrusting, but most, some people may enjoy that, but most people are actually going to want to use it externally on the, on the clitoris. Yeah. And so it's not actually even. And so as long as we're on the clitoris, let me raise an important point for the male listeners out there that I know a lot of you have got the majority of your sex education from you porn and Pornhub, but. Don't do those things. Hard thrusting, <laughs> hard pounding isn't always the best way to help a woman along. Yes. Then you want to start off as gently and slowly and lightly as you can, and then build up from there based on what she likes. Yeah. But think yeah. of touching the clitoris as lightly as you yeah. possibly can. I can't, every time someone's like slapping it, I'm like cringing internally. And, and also make sure that it's wet. That yeah. helps too. Yeah. Um, so just just a tip. And, and the other thing that I want you to pay attention to is I've heard from another sex researcher that it takes the male body about seven minutes on average to reach full physiological arousal. The woman is somewhere around 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. take your time. Take your time. And, and yeah. again, think of foreplay as all day long, not necessarily physical touch, but texting, calling, notes. I'm thinking of you. I can't wait to be with you. I love you. You look beautiful in your outfit today. All that stuff goes a long way. Absolutely. I think there's also a lot to be said for like remembering that it's, yeah, that it's like sex starts in our brains. And so the more that you can, you know, the more that you can start there, but even physically, that because the clitoris has so many nerve endings, it's like the last place you want to go. You want to be, you want to go everywhere else first, because the more you give that erectile tissue time to kind of become, to like fill with blood and become engorged and sort of do, do all of the things that erectile tissue needs to do. Like the more time you give it, the more than when you get there, the better it will feel. If you go Mm -hmm. too early, it's painful. Uh, And I think a lot of, I think a lot of women either don't know that it's not supposed to feel that way or don't feel like they can tell their partners. Um, and so kind of, we, we get tons and tons of questions on, okay. So from people who are like, am I having an orgasm? Like I, this doesn't feel when I touch my clit, it like, doesn't really feel that good. And so part of what we talk to people about is this idea of like, really take your time, go slowly, like build, build it up, like, wait. And I often say like, wait until she's actually like moving you there. Wait, you know, like wait until she's like, will you come on? You know, and and part of this this idea that, that this surprised me also that a large percentage of women experience pain during sex, I think over 50%, not all the time, but at times, and they don't feel safe enough to speak up about it. So they don't really enjoy sex. So one of the keys for us men is to make our women feel safe let them, you know, encourage them to speak up. Does this feel good? I want you to feel safe and secure. Like, how is this? And don't be a dick when they finally speak up. You yeah. have to respond with kindness and understanding and not get angry, not get your feelings hurt, not get defensive and just go, yeah, okay, thanks for telling me. Let me try that out. Right. Well, and again, it really comes back to understanding our sexual anatomy and how it functions because everything every you know the vagina the clitoris all of it is erectile tissue so i i think often people have this idea of the vagina as like being like a like a plastic water bottle or something like it's sort of always hanging out like in this open circle just like waiting sort of like perpetually like waiting for something to I fill it never right? thought about it like that <laughs> i know i know and yet when you talk to people it's this idea right this is where penis size fears come from 
is this idea that like the vagina has some kind of like, is like a, is some kind of like open space that needs to be filled. And if it's not filled enough, then she won't be happy. Right. And that's the most, the, the fact about sex that men Google the most is, is my penis big enough? Like mm-hmm. there's so much anxiety about this. And I, about that. Yeah. yeah. So this is where this comes from is this idea that like, yeah, that the vagina is like hanging out, like waiting for waiting to okay. be filled. When in reality, it actually is like this, all the sides of the vagina are touching each other. Um, and so it's more like a balloon. So, right. Like when you have a completely deflated balloon, it inflates with the air that you put in it and it, it can't be any bigger than that. It is like it just as big as whatever is going inside it. If you blow up a balloon too quickly, it will pop. Or if you go right, like, so the same kind of concept is that the more aroused a woman is, the more that erectile tissue in the vagina, it can, it, the, the easier it is for it to kind of accept like whatever is, is going in. Right. So because that tissue is like, revved up and excited. If it's, if someone is not aroused at all, then sex is going to be generally painful. um, What's the connection between arousal and wetness? That's a really great question. And I think people, again, like there is this idea that they are, there's like a direct correlation between how aroused you are and how wet you are. When in fact, by I, sometimes I feel like a broken record because it totally depends on the person. So some people have tons and tons and tons of wetness. Some people don't have as much. Um, it can depend on what part of someone's cycle, their menstrual cycle they're in. Medications can affect it. Stress can affect it. Pregnancy can affect it. There's menopause, right? There's sort of lots of different things. And so I, I know often that men sort of see, like try to use that as like a gauge uh, for how aroused someone is when in fact, like it doesn't, uh, it's not actually an accurate indicator and lube, just like lube that you would buy at a store is my favorite sex toy. And the uh-huh. thing that I recommend all the time. And I, again, there's a lot of like hangups about using lube because it's sort of like, I should need it. We should need it. <laughs> And like from women too, like yeah. all the time, like people are like, I should get like, wet just with yeah, the, like, you and I'm, I. I'm broken if we need this, yeah. but in fact, like there are times in all of our lives when, when we need it and it increases good friction and it decreases bad friction and it makes sex toys much easier to use. And it's awesome. And just everybody should have some. Well, going back to that idea earlier about the clitoris needing to be wet. Yes. To be to feel best when you touch it. Yes. You know, when it's dry and sticky, it doesn't feel as good. So to put lube on there, I mean, it helps everything and, and you don't want to yeah. over lube, but it's, it's a great, another augmentation. Yeah, it's exactly. It's make things better. Exactly. Um, it's so not like a crutch, it's a tool. Let me yeah. go to one other topic, which confused me all my life. I didn't know about it for much of my life. And then I'm still confused about it. Let's talk a bit about female ejaculation. Mm-hmm. What the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, so going back to embryonic tissue and then how sort of how everybody develops in the womb. Um, so we all like all of the kind of tissue in the genital area as babies develop become either the sort of male anatomy or female anatomy. I'm being very simple here, but essentially this, and they all have analogous tissue. So penis and clitoris are analogous ovaries and, testes, those are analogous, right? They come from the same tissue. So the, um, the tissue that makes up the G spot is the same tissue that makes up the prostate. Um, so those are sort of analogous Mm -hmm. embryonic tissue and they've actually tested female ejaculate fluid and found that it has many of the same properties as prostate fluid. Um, and so prostate fluid serves like one of, it has sort of two functions. Um, one is that it helps the sperm get through the vas deferens and out of the body without dying. Cause sometimes there's like leftover ureic acid from urination. So you need the, the vas deferens to be like a nice hospitable, not be like killing sperm on the way out. And then, uh, it can, it makes up part of like ejaculation is, is made up of sperm and, um, prostate fluid and fluid from the seminal vesicle. And all of that together is also food, 
for this firm, like as their sort of helps keep them the idea, right. To help them theoretically get to an egg. Um, and so that fluid actually is very similar to female ejaculate fluid and the prostate surrounds the urethra or the vas deferens in men. And the G spot is like right up against the urethra in women as well. So it really like, again, so, so similar in terms of structure. Um, and so then essentially it's erectile tissue and, uh, you can, the, the fluid, like if you stimulate it, you can develop fluid in it that can then, that then, um, moves into the urethra and gets, and can come out of the body. Often it, it can be hard, I think for women to, to do it because it feels like they're peeing. And so they're really worried that they're peeing. They've got to relax enough. And then it feels like you're urinating and it's hard to tell the difference. Is that? Yeah. It can be a little hard to tell the difference. Um, and yeah, it, it is. And so or maybe the first time or maybe the first yeah, time. Yeah, you kind of figure, yeah, I think as you go, but especially at the beginning, it, it can be really hard to tell. And so a couple of like sort of basic G-spot like tips and tricks. So the first is go to the bathroom ahead of time. I have like, she should go to the bathroom ahead of time. That way, you know, the bladder is like empty, mm-hmm. put a towel down or mm-hmm. some way of like not, you know, not having to worry about it so that you can just relax and, and let go. Um, and recognize that like, yeah, yeah, Not whatever it is. <laughs> yes. And, and recognize that like, there might be, it might be pee, right? So like, how are we all going to handle that if that's what happens? And like, can we be cool? Um, so that's sort of the other piece of it. And then to find the G spot, essentially, like if you think of the, if you like make a sort of V with your hand, uh, pointing down and like the thumb is on one side and your fingers on the other, and the clitoris is sort of where your thumb and your fingers meet, then you can like put your hand in and curl your fingers to the kind of padded part behind your thumb. Mm -hmm. And that's where the G spot is. So it's really just like one to two, not even really two inches. in. it's just like one because the urethra is very short in women's bodies. Like the bladder is just right there. So you're just going in and up towards the, towards the front of the body, towards the belly button. Um, and it needs generally a pretty firm, repetitive stimulation to, again, to kind of, if you're really trying for, for ejaculation to like kind of build up that fluid and it can take a little while. So this is where a sex toy can be great because mm. a lot of people's fingers or wrists get a little tired of that, but a nice, like curved, hard toy can do a great job at this. Um, and then if there's a sensation of feeling like if you're doing it, if you've been doing it for a while and someone feels like they have to pee, then you can try kind of removing the toy and trying to like bear down a little bit and see what happens for some people. It happens very easily for other people. It will never happen. Mm -hmm. Um, for some people, G spot simulation feels amazing for some people. It's sort of like, meh, but it's a thing that's happening to me, <laughs> but like not that great. So part of all of like any, like everything else, part of it is figuring out like, is this body, is this G spot a G spot that's like in for this? Or is this G spot like, nah, go pay attention to the clip. The clip's like really where the party's at. Right? Again, back to communication. Yep, exactly. So it's, and it's for, we often will talk to women about like doing some of this by themselves uh, if they're really curious about it, just to see, cause sometimes it's easier when you're by yourself just to mm-hmm. kind of see what's going to happen. Yeah. You can um, relax more. Yeah. Without feeling like mm-hmm. it has to go well. Uh, but the more, I think just in general, the more that any couple can try to approach new things like this from a really kind of laid back, like, let's just see what happens. We don't have mm-hmm. any expectations. No judgment. Kind of, yeah. No judgment, no thoughts about like, it has to work this way or it will be like this then the, you know, that is going to help everyone relax and just see what happens. So let me ask you this. Do you have changing subjects a little bit? Cause a lot of this revolves around communication, right? So what if I'm in a couple, I'm in a committed relationship and I want to try out some kink, how would you suggest approaching my partner um, to begin that conversation? Well, I think that one of the first things to get clear about is what that means for you. So kink as a category is like super broad and I, there are the kind okay, of two, restraints. Okay. Restraints. Cause there's sort of like pain, specific. there's like pain yeah, yeah. 
and power, I'm try right? To so blunt force trauma with a <laughs> yeah. So if you're talking about restraints, right? So like handcuffs or something like that. I think um, this is where again having having time set aside where you're going to have conversations is really helpful because it's incredibly hard to think about sort of how do you approach this with someone? Like, do you just bring it up out of the middle of nowhere, right? But if you have if you're having regular conversations already and part of those conversations can be about like, what are things that we might want to try or do? It's much easier to kind of bring it up in that context. The other thing that, uh, that is a great tool for couples is what's called the yes, no, maybe list. There you go. You can find these if you Google them online, right. And you make a list of everything you generally love to do things that you're interested in and things that you don't like to do. And then you compare your lists and you recognize that like, a day from now, a month from now, a year from now, things on those lists are going to move around. But that, you know, putting, if one person has that on their yes list and the other person can kind of consider it and you can talk about it. I also, anytime you're thinking about, especially things like restraints or pain, uh, learning a little bit about it, like buying a book, (laughs) reading some articles, going to a class, like you know, uh, reaching out to a professional sex educator can be incredibly helpful because there are ways that people can get hurt, really, like truly hurt. Yeah. And so having some of those basic pieces, like with restraints, you know, you want to use something that is um, really broad, that has like, a, that that is wide. You don't want to use something like a scarf uh, because a scarf gets very narrow and tight and then you can't undo it. If you, if someone panics and they want to get out very quickly, you need to make sure that you can get them out, right? And the scarf will get very narrow and cut off circulation very quickly before you realize it. You never want to leave someone in a room alone while they're Mm -hmm. restrained. No matter what you're, even if you just feel like you're popping to the bathroom to grab something and back, you don't do it, right? So there are just certain things like that, that I think it's just helpful to know from a safety perspective. Um, but then what you really want to do is say like very simply sort of, this is something that I'm interested in trying. How do you feel about it? And try to give that person sort of all of the space that, that they might need to think through it and have their feelings and, and then try to create space to really talk through like, what would this, what would it look like if we tried this and what are your boundaries? What are my boundaries? And this is something where I think people who don't practice kink like this is what the kink community does every time is like have an entire conversation about what are the things that you like to do what are the things that you don't like to do where are your boundaries how do I know if you want me to stop like very clear conversations mm-hmm. that we could all be doing every single time that mm-hmm. we have sex but for some reason it's like again sort of over in this other part yeah I've, I've found they're expert at it and I, I mean I, I think one of the things that I also like is just the languaging around, are you available for this? And the yes, no, maybe list I think is brilliant because I think it, it's a non-defensive or non-threatening way to say, this is what I would like to check out. This is what I would like to check out. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of interested in this, but I don't really know this definitely no. But then to talk about it as, you know, are you available for this tonight? And to be able to say without judgment, without defensiveness, without blowback, yes, I'm available for this no, I'm not available for this right now, or no, I'm not available for this at all, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and, and I think a big part of that is to not be too attached to the outcome. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that one can be hard. Like if I really want to try restraints and my partner's not into that, and they're just like, no, I'm not available for that ever. If I'm really attached to that outcome, then I might get a little bit yeah. emotional. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that just to be open to the conversation to be open to different outcomes and to be happy with where you do meet. Um, I think it's a good way to go. Absolutely. And I think a lot, especially with a lot of kink stuff part and to some degree, uh, some of it is also about figuring out like ultimately what is it that you're interested in? So like with restraints, is it restraining someone or is it the power mm-hmm. dynamic that you have over that person? Um, in which case, like, if someone feels uncomfortable with physically being restrained, you can restrain, you can tell someone that they can't move. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you don't actually have to restrain them. You can find other ways of restraining someone or is it the power piece and your partner's actually really uncomfortable with that power dynamic Mm -hmm. for reasons that are really legitimate, right. That people 
might not want to feel dominated in that way. And so kind of uncovering a little bit of like what's behind some of the things that we want to try, because I think sometimes we want to try them for reasons that are not the actual thing. Uh, and then that can be really helpful in our conversations. Well, because it's find more interesting. Great you know, I've talked to a lot of, of women who really like to be restrained. And it, it, the, the reasoning is fascinating to me. It's because they're always doing stuff and they're always yeah. making decisions. And this is like the 10, 15, 20 minutes where they don't have to make a single decision. They completely yeah. give up control of their lives for that limited period of time. And that to me kind of was mind blowing. Yeah. I mean, I, I get think it. it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. There's a lot of like you're being taken care of, uh-huh. right? Like it a good, nurturing. yeah. Like, a, you know, I think we have this idea of sort of the, the like kink and BDSM world as being about like this person has power and this person doesn't have power. But in reality, it's almost the exact opposite <laughs> because like the person who's being dominated has di- dictated all the ways in which like they want to be dominated and they're actually what they're getting from it is, you know, so yeah, it's, a, it's, I think much, it's, it's paradoxical. Certainly much more complicated than 50 shades of gray makes it out to be. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the reason, the reason why I wanted to go into this topic and the reason why I feel it's very important is I think a lot of people are in long-term relationships and over time the sex, their sex life gets vanilla and Mm -hmm. it gets routine and mundane. And because of that hedonic treadmill phenomenon where we adapt to everything, we just start to take it for granted. And as soon as you take it for granted, it becomes almost an obligation. You're like, yeah, okay, well, let's have sex tonight. It's Friday night. Like, okay, five minutes Mm -hmm. in and out. Thank you. And it doesn't really add much to your life satisfaction. And so to, to be curious to vary things, to introduce some novelty and excitement and variety, I think is, is hugely important. Absolutely. When I, I really think that just the shift of setting aside time to have a regular conversation about your sex life, that alone keeps that from happening because the thing that we often, we do in our lives, right. Is that we just kind of keep going. Like we're just, going along, like we're not setting a goal or we're not checking in about something. And we look up and five years have gone by and we're like, how did that happen? So the more, if we can set a regular check-in, like things, those things are happening in our brains all the time. Like those feelings, we just, we need to make space for them that feels safe. And if you can make that space, then that, I think a lot of these things, like, you know, a lot of people would come into Babeland sort of like, we're here to like spice up our sex lives. And I was like, yep, I'm with you. Like, let's, let's spice it up. But can I tell you the thing you really need to be doing is talking about it regularly. Then you will find that in fact, it is very spicy. Well, the the thing that's really interesting about that and fun is that you, when, when you have these conversations about your sex life, the very conversation is spicing it up. It's exciting. It's arousing. It's building anticipation. And, And so it's doing exactly what you want to be done going to Babeland or Good Vibrations, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. just Precisely. with communication. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a, there's a whole, I mean, sex toys are amazing. I love them, obviously. Like, I think they're incredible. And there are like thousands of things that you can do that don't involve that at all. There's role playing and all, power dynamics and, you know, different things around your house. Although be careful with some of them, cause not everything is like a super safe thing to use, but different places, different times, different, you know, there's so many different things. And usually people have things that they're curious about or that they want to do. And so you really just need to, to create a space that feels safe enough to, to talk through all of that. Hey, so at least I got to wrap up now and I've, this has been a fantastic conversation. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Give me a plug for, okay. So tell me about, okay. So where, where do we find it? Uh, You told me a little bit about volunteering opportunities too, and really short time increments too. So give a three minute plug for that if you would. Sure. So, okay. So is an app on the app store. We're not on Android yet, but we are working on it uh, right now. And so we, you can find us on the app store searching OKAYSO. It's worth a free app. And when you download okay, so you can ask any questions that you have about sex, dating, relationships, identity, stress, uh, to teams of vetted volunteer experts, and you will get personalized responses. So you can think about it like a group chat, essentially, where you get to write your question in whatever your own words are. 
And then uh, at least one expert, sometimes multiple experts will get back to you and you can have a conversation with them until you feel like you've gotten the answer that you need. And that's within 24 hours? Is that- yeah, we get back to folks within 24 hours. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then we're um, talking about volunteer ops. Yeah. So our volunteers, all of our volunteers have some kind of training in sort of sexual health or related areas, but they're all volunteers. So we actually, they only volunteer for about 15 minutes a day because it's on their phone. So they can kind of, the idea is that they hop in and out when they have a spare minute. So waiting for a meeting to start or waiting for pasta to boil or laying in bed at night, kind of all of those times when we're looking at Facebook or Instagram, we want to try to capture some of those moments and create an opportunity for people to give back and to help people. So yeah, 15 minutes a day. Um, and if people are interested in volunteering, then the easiest way is to email me, uh, elise at okso.co and we can chat. Um, you can also apply through the app, but it takes us a little bit longer to get back to you that way. Okay. So I made an assumption there that that was the biggest thing that you wanted to share. Is there other social media or other things that you're doing? Yeah. So you can follow, I mean, I, for us, I really think like we, we welcome anyone who wants to ask a question. Um, if you, if they're, you know, we target, uh, teenagers, but our, oldest user was 79. (laughs) So, uh, we know that there are people who have questions about this stuff sort of throughout our lives. So we're super happy to have, um, questions from anyone who has them. And if you have expertise and you want to give back, like we would love to get connected to you and you can find us on, we're mostly active on Instagram and our, but on all of our social media, our handles are, Hey, okay. So, um, so you can find us there and kind of see what we're doing. Um, on social media, but yeah, download the app, tell your friends, tell teenagers that, you know, if you know them, cause everybody's, everybody's got stuff, right? Like almost everybody has some question that they have or some fear that they have or that, you know, and something they're too afraid they, to ask anyone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you're totally anonymous on, okay. So like you, you give us a username that you pick. We don't know anything about you at all. We don't have a picture. We don't, you know, the experts don't see anything. They only know what you, what the user shares with us. So we really want to try to create a space where people can say all the things that they've been maybe too afraid to say to anyone else. Fantastic. Well, I think it's a brilliant idea for an app and I I thank you for doing it. Um, And thank you for joining me here. That was, that was a hell of a conversation. Thank you for having me. It was really fun. All right. And that's it for this episode of the Evolved Caveman. Be sure to check out the ultimate relationship.com for the latest info on the couples retreat that we're doing in Costa Rica, September 12th to the 19th of 2020. Thanks, and we'll check in with you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Evolved Caveman Podcast. If you like what you've heard, support us by subscribing, leaving reviews, and sharing the podcast with friends and colleagues. For the latest, most powerful tools to connect with like-minded men, join the Facebook group at The Evolved Caveman. Follow Dr. John on Instagram at The Evolved Caveman, all one word, or join the email list by visiting guidetoself.com. 